The story begins on June 13, 1980, in the town of Wiley, Texas. At first glance, we see a house that gives the impression of any other peaceful residence in the suburbs. However, as the camera gradually explores the rooms inside, we notice traces of blood on the walls and floor, especially in the bathroom. In a flashback, we're taken back to September 1978, two years prior, at a Sunday service in the Methodist Church of Lucas. After the service, the congregation gathers for lunch, where we're introduced to Candy Montgomery, her husband Pat Montgomery, Alan Gore, and his wife Betty Gore. Later that day, Pastor Jackie, a close friend of Candy, pays her a visit. Jackie confides in Candy, revealing her intention to divorce her husband, but expressing concerns about how the townspeople will perceive her. Candy tries to comfort her friend and uplift her spirits, addressing Jackie's insecurities about being a single woman and a pastor. The week progresses, and the following Sunday, news of Jackie's impending divorce circulates within the church. Afterward, the entire congregation gathers for a volleyball match. Pat and Betty watch from the stands as Candy and Alan find themselves competing on the same team. During the game, Alan accidentally knocks Candy over and extends a helping hand to lift her up. At that moment, something shifts in the atmosphere as Candy sees Alan in a different light for the first time. Later that evening, Candy confines in her friend Sherry, sharing her surprising attraction towards Alan. She admits that his presence and scent evokes feelings of desire in her, which she finds absurd considering his appearance. Feeling lost in her own marriage, Candy contemplates introducing excitement into her life. As the days pass, thoughts of Alan occupy her mind at odd moments, whether she's with her family watching movies or attending her creative writing class. One night after choir practice, Candy spots Alan getting into his car parked next to hers. Seizing the opportunity, she approaches him and confesses her infatuation. However, Alan remains unresponsive, and they part ways. Candy later recounts the encounter to Sherry, puzzled by Alan's apparent lack of interest. Meanwhile, Alan also finds himself thinking about Candy throughout the day. However, at home, he faces his own challenges, as Betty continually insists on things being done her way, while he remains indifferent. This dynamic leads to growing frustration and frequent arguments between Alan and Betty. On the other hand, Pat and Candy's marriage is also experiencing a rough patch. Candy perceives Pat's waning interest in her, feeling a lack of love and attention from him, which further strains their relationship. After the next volleyball game, Alan asks Candy about her intentions from their previous discussion. Seeking excitement in her life, she expresses her desire to have an affair. Alan's taken aback by her proposal and rejects it, but it's evident that he's considering the idea. He accidentally reveals that Betty's pregnant, emphasizing that it would be incredibly unfair to cheat on her. Alan discloses that Betty had previously had an affair, and he knows how much pain infidelity causes. Both of them affirm their love for their respective partners and express their commitment to remain faithful. Surprisingly, Alan kisses her on the lips and abruptly leaves the car. The following day, Jackie pays Candy a visit and informs her that she's accepted a job offer. She adds that the church will have a new, younger pastor, and Candy feels heartbroken at the thought of losing her friend. Just then, Alan calls her and asks to meet for lunch, leading Jackie to discover that Candy's considering having an affair. Candy explains that her life as a homemaker feels empty and lacks the rewards that would motivate her to be a better wife and mother. Jackie tries to dissuade her friend from pursuing the affair, but realizes that Candy's already made up her mind. The following day, Alan and Candy have lunch together and discuss the potential affair. In the following weeks, both Alan and Candy create lists of the pros and cons of engaging in an affair. After careful planning, Candy invites Alan to her place to discuss the rules of the affair, prioritizing ending it if either of them develops an emotional attachment. They plan to meet at a hotel outside of town on December 12, 1978 for their first encounter. On that day, Candy prepares herself, packs a lunch, and drives to a motel out of town. Initially hesitant, she calls Alan to inform him of the location and room number. Upon his arrival, they share a meal and eventually sleep together. Then Candy insists that they take a shower afterward to avoid carrying each other's scent. Now, as Candy showers in the motel, there's a glimpse of her in the future, showering off blood from her body, hinting at a dark turn of events. Back in the present, Candy's pleasantly surprised by how good Alan is in bed. He joins her in the shower, mentioning that he's running late for work, and they continue with their week as usual. The following Sunday at church, the choir team bids farewell to Jackie as she introduces the congregation to their new pastor, Ron, and his wife, Mary. However, Betty appears displeased with Ron joining the church. A week later, during one of their regular rendezvous, Alan opens up about Betty's difficulties with her hormonal state due to the pregnancy. He blames himself for leaving his wife to handle everything alone and feels guilty. However, despite such reservations, they still end up sleeping together, 
as Alan's desire for candy overwhelms other considerations. Months pass, and the affair persists. Although they initially agreed that their relationship would be purely physical, their connection becomes more serious, and they both develop a fondness for each other. However, it's evident that Candy's more emotionally invested in the affair, possibly because Alan gives her the attention she's longed for. During one of their motel meetups, Alan suggests putting their hookups on hold, as Betty's approaching labor, and he wants to be close to home in case she needs him. While Candy understands his reasoning, she becomes possessive and insecure at the thought of Alan spending more time with his wife. So, she confesses that she's starting to fall in love with him. Although Alan doesn't admit the same, he expresses that he isn't interested in ending the affair. Moreover, he reveals that their affair has surprisingly improved his marriage with Betty. Meanwhile, Alan and Betty welcome their baby girl into the world. Betty begins feeling that Alan's lost interest in her and is no longer attracted to her, leading to a meltdown one night. This prompts Alan to dedicate himself to his family and end his relationship with Candy. After some time has passed, Alan unexpectedly contacts Candy and arranges a lunch meeting. During their conversation, he informs her that he's accepted a new job and reveals that Betty suggested attending a program called Marriage Encounter, intending to work on their troubled relationship. Upon hearing this, Candy's initial response is one of concern. She fears that if Alan and Betty are able to reconcile and improve their relationship, he may no longer have any interest in maintaining his affair with her. Despite her mixed feelings, Candy offers to look after their daughter while they're away. During the marriage encounter, Betty and Alan begin to communicate and understand each other better. Alan realizes Betty's insecurities and assures her that he's still attracted to her. The couple finally make love after a long time and renew their vows. They then return and go straight to Candy's house to pick up their children. Both Betty and Alan express gratitude to Candy and praise the positive impact of the marriage encounter program. This leaves Candy to become envious as she stares through the window at the happy couple. Soon enough, Alan realizes that he's been emotionally unavailable to his wife and children recently. He meets with Candy, who asks if he truly wants to end their affair. Angry and hurt that Alan's not taking her feelings into account and is prioritizing Betty, Candy storms off. Weeks pass, and Candy tries to move on from Alan. She confides in Sherry, expressing how rejected she felt, which hurt her deeply. Sherry advises her to stop meeting Alan altogether and move on. Later, she visits Betty and the two have an awkward conversation. Then, when Alan returns home, Betty asks him to walk Candy to her car. When Candy giggles at his words, Betty observes them through the window in suspicion. Later that evening, Candy talks to Pad about the marriage encounter program and convinces him to go along with her. During the program, they initially struggle to open up and share their feelings with each other, but eventually, they both start to communicate honestly about their desires and expectations in the relationship. Candy tells Sherry about the positive changes she's seen in her relationship with Pat, including improvements in their sex life. She admits that she rarely thinks about Alan anymore. However, when Betty invites Candy and Pat over for dinner, Candy confesses to Alan that seeing him in person would reignite her feelings for him. The dinner with Betty goes well, and afterwards, Candy attends a Bible study retreat. Meanwhile, back at home, Pat decides to search through their belongings to find a letter Candy wrote him before they got married. Instead, he discovers a letter from Alan to Candy, which devastates him. Soon, Pat meets with Sherry and confronts her about the affair, asking if it's truly over. Sherry tries to explain that it ended a long time ago. Pat then asks that Sherry keep this information from Candy, as he wants to discuss it with her personally, but she ultimately informs her. After returning from the retreat, Candy tries to remain calm while anticipating Pat's reaction. That night, Pat presents her with a bouquet of flowers and a heartfelt letter he wrote, causing Candy to break down in tears. She apologizes to Pat, who suggests they go away together in an effort to strengthen their relationship. After a few months have passed, Candy finds herself preparing for a hectic day. The story takes us back to June 13, 1980, when her daughter asks if Alyssa can stay for another night and join the family for a movie. Candy agrees to the request and realizes that she needs to stop by Betty's place to pick up Alyssa's bathing suit for her swim practice the next day. At Betty's house, Alan's busy packing for a two-day business trip while Betty's upset about him leaving. He then tries to console her as she experiences a breakdown before leaving for work. Meanwhile, Candy's engaged in a summer session with the children from the congregation. She vents about her daily tasks and mentions to a friend that she has to visit Betty. Later, Candy arrives at the scene, and during their conversation, Betty blatantly asks if she's having an affair with Alan. Initially, Candy denies it, but eventually admits the truth and apologizes to her. With this, Betty stares at her with a blank expression before abruptly leaving the room. Shockingly, she returns holding an axe and, in a fit of anger, warns Candy to stay away from Alan. 
Terrified, Candy also agrees, and with sympathy in her eyes, she apologizes one last time before leaving. But unfortunately, this only triggers Betty's rage, and she pushes Candy into the laundry room, trying to strike at her with the axe. Before Candy can regain control, she swiftly strikes, severing the tip of one of Candy's toes. The next time we see Candy, she emerges from the house, soaked from the shower she took. Additionally, she's bleeding from her other wounds, but manages to drive back to her own home. Throughout the day, Candy sticks to her routine while attempting to calm herself down. She carefully creates an alibi, rehearsing her story, and shares it with anyone willing to listen. According to her account, she went to Betty's house and lost track of time before running errands and returning to the church. Elsewhere, Alan attempts to contact his wife but is unable to reach her. Growing increasingly concerned, he contacts his neighbors and asks them to check on Betty in their house. He also calls Candy and inquires about his wife's whereabouts, but she lies and assures him that Betty was fine when she left the house earlier that afternoon. Meanwhile, the neighbors take action and enter Alan's house through the open garage door. Inside, they make a distressing discovery, a crying baby and Betty's lifeless body in the laundry room. The presence of a significant amount of blood leads them, and later the police, to conclude that she was shot. The authorities are promptly contacted, and one of the men informs Alan of the tragic news over the phone. Alan then immediately calls Candy to share the heartbreaking information about Betty's death. As the police arrive at the scene and begin their investigation, they engage in a conversation with Alan. He then informs them that Candy was the last person to see Betty alive when she went to get Alyssa's swimsuit. The following morning, Candy receives a call from Alan, who informs her that the police are aware of her visit to his house. Rumors about the murder spread rapidly through the town, causing a frenzy of gossip. In the midst of this, Candy learns that the authorities are aware that Betty was killed with an axe. The police determine that the murder was not premeditated, and based on the footprints discovered at the crime scene, they believe the perpetrator is a woman. Eventually, Alan returns home, devastated by the news of Betty's murder. Overwhelmed with guilt, he blames himself for not being there for his wife. Candy and Pat bring Alyssa back home, and Alan requests that they remain present as Candy breaks the tragic news to their daughter. The following day at church, the congregation engages in conversations with Don, a lawyer and member of the church. Candy approaches them and requests a private conversation, expressing her concern about being the second to last person to see Betty alive. She wonders if she should be worried. Don, however, assures her that Betty's murder was a brutal act likely committed by a strong man, so she shouldn't be concerned. Later, Candy visits the police station for her interrogation and recounts her rehearsed story to the officers. Suddenly, the police chief asks Candy about the shoes she wore on the day of Betty's murder. They explain that footprints were found at the crime scene, and they need to compare the footprints of everyone who's been to Betty's house to rule them out as suspects. In a blatant lie, Candy claims she was wearing tennis shoes. However, once she returns home, she proceeds to destroy the slippers that she had worn to Betty's house that day. Afterward, the police also question Alan about potential suspects in the murder case. He admits that Betty had an affair but denies his own involvement in any extramarital relationships. However, as the evening progresses, Alan eventually confesses that he did have an affair with Candy Montgomery. Eventually, the police call Candy for further questioning and request a fingerprint sample from her. They then inquire about her relationship with Alan, to which she responds that it ended eight months ago. They then ask Candy to provide a pair of slippers to measure her foot size and notice a cut on her foot. Feeling uneasy about the accusation, Candy and Pat talk to Dawn, seeking his assistance in handling the case. Now, Don advises them to share any confidential information only after officially hiring him as their attorney. He then requests Pat to leave the room and encourages her to be honest if she's guilty. However, Candy persists in asserting her innocence. Consequently, Don assures her that he'll help her through this ordeal and advises her to refrain from any contact with Alan. In the meantime, Alan finds himself in Betty's hometown attending a memorial service for her alongside her family. He confesses to Betty's parents about his affair with Candy and the fact that she's now considered a suspect in the murder. Back at Candy's house, a reporter arrives for an interview with Candy regarding her involvement in the case. Worried about the situation, Candy contacts Don to inform him that the police are interacting with the media. Don promptly calls Candy to his office, where she finally confesses to him that she is indeed the one who killed Betty. She constructs a narrative stating that Betty attacked her with an axe and she acted in self-defense to protect herself. Following this, Dawn urges Candy to maintain confidentiality between them and informs her about an upcoming polygraph test she'll have to undergo. Acknowledging his inexperience in such cases, Dawn mentions the need for assistance from a criminal lawyer named Robert. Both Alan and Candy undergo the polygraph test. 
However, when Candy's questioned about her injured toe and anything related to the laundry room, she becomes visibly anxious, which the examiner notices. Later that night, Candy and Pat argue regarding her pair of slippers, and she lies to him, claiming that she discarded them. Meanwhile, Don discovers that Alan has passed his polygraph test. He then calls Candy to inform her that the state has issued an arrest warrant for her and requests Pat to arrange $10,000 from her $100,000 bond for bail. Now the news broadcasts Candy's arrest, while Don and Robert work on securing the bond for her bail. She's then taken into custody, leaving both her and Robert shocked. Afterwards, she undergoes a process of undressing, during which her body bruises are examined and recorded. Don informs Pat that their bond has been rejected, and Candy will have to spend the night in jail. Nevertheless, he assures Pat that he'll secure her release the following morning. Meanwhile, the news reports speculate on Alan's affair as a potential motive for Betty's murder and reveal that Candy's thumbprint has been found on the refrigerator door at the house. The following morning, Candy's released from prison and Don addresses the reporters, proclaiming Candy's innocence. Determined to rectify the situation, Don insists that Candy needs to lose weight and appear frail so that the court and the jury cannot perceive her as someone capable of wielding a heavy weapon like an axe. In addition to this, he also urges her to visit a psychiatrist in Houston. The following morning, Don speaks with Pastor Ron and expresses how Candy's trial will impact the church, emphasizing the need to rally the congregation in support of Candy. Two weeks later, during the bail hearing, Don has a tense exchange with the judge, resulting in an unfavorable outcome for Candy. At Jackie's house, Pat informs her that Candy's keeping many details of the case hidden. With this information, Jackie confronts Candy, seeking answers about her cuts and bruises, but she simply evades the questions and maintains her innocence. Following this, Pat causes a scene at Dawn's office, demanding answers about Candy's situation. Meanwhile, Candy undergoes a therapy session, which helps her confront her deepest fears, including childhood trauma, leading to an emotional breakdown during the session. Afterwards, tension grows between Candy and Pat after he learns from Dawn that she did kill Betty. The next day at the courthouse, Dawn surprises everyone by publicly acknowledging that Candy did kill Betty, but argues that it was an act of self-defense. He claims that Candy is the only living witness who can reveal the horrors of what transpired that night. Upon hearing this, Betty's father talks to Alan, attempting to make sense of the self-defense argument presented by Candy's defense team. On the day of the hearing, Tensions rise between Judge Tom and Dawn as they argue about Dawn's statements to the press. The judge then holds Dawn in contempt of court, ordering him to serve 24 hours in prison and pay a fine. The prosecution then calls Alan to the stand as their first witness, questioning him about his affair with Candy and whether Betty was aware of it. However, Alan claims he was unsure if Betty knew about the affair. Holding on to this uncertainty, Dawn cross-examines him about Betty's behavior before her death, painting her in a negative light. He then argues that Alan and Candy were not in love, suggesting that jealousy was not a motive for Candy to murder Betty. During all of this chaos, the entire town speaks ill of Candy, but Sherry remains supportive of her friend. The following hearings include testimonies from neighbors who discovered Betty's body and church people who interacted with Candy after the incident, recounting the brutal murder scene and other events. Meanwhile, Don insists that Candy stop taking medication to suppress her emotions believing that the jury needs to see her vulnerability. On the other hand, Pat expresses gratitude that Candy survived the incident considering Betty's size. Meanwhile, Dawn continues defending Candy in the media, and during the second hearing, the prosecution examines the investigating officers. Dawn cross-examines them, attempting to propose that Candy did not plan the murder due to the messy crime scene and the presence of evidence such as her fingerprints. In the next hearing, the pathologist describes the gruesome wounds on Betty's body including the distinction between pre-mortem and post-mortem injuries. He claims that Candy brutally assaulted Betty 40 times while she was alive and once after her death. Don tries to counter-examine the pathologist, arguing that self-defense cannot be ruled out. As the prosecution rests its case, Judge Tom calls Candy as the defense's first witness. She faces intense questioning from Don, who's urged her to be as vulnerable as possible to sway the jury. He begins by asking if she'd been involved in any previous physical altercations, and Candy denies any such incidents. Next, Don proceeds to question her about the day of the murder and the events that followed. Candy then recounts the affair she had with Alan and describes the sudden attack by Betty. She reveals that Betty hit her on the head and forcefully struck the axe into her leg. As Candy relives the traumatic moment, she begins to break down emotionally. Furthermore, she explains that she believed Betty intended to kill her which prompted her to grab the axe from her hand to defend herself. 
Then Candy tearfully admits that she struck Betty once, and when she told her to be quiet, she struck her multiple times on the head out of fear. She then asserts that she never intended to kill Betty, emphasizing that it was a situation that unfolded in the heat of the moment. Later, Dawn brings the axe used in the murder in front of Candy during the court proceedings, causing her to break down emotionally. The prosecution proceeds to cross-examine Candy about the incident and presents a piece of evidence, the lens to her sunglasses, which was found in Betty's garage. The prosecutor alleges that Candy had gone to the garage herself to retrieve the axe, contradicting her earlier statement. In her defense, Candy tries to explain that the lens may have ended up in the garage during the physical altercation with Betty. However, the hearing takes a turn against Candy as her credibility is called into question. Following the intense hearing, Dawn suggests that Dr. Fred Fasson, Candy's psychiatrist, be called as their next witness. Additionally, he also reveals his intention for Pat to testify next on the stand. The trial continues to unfold, with Candy's fate and the jury's decision hanging in the balance. As discussed, Pat takes the stand as a witness and takes responsibility for Candy's relationship with Alan. He admits that his emotional unavailability drove Candy to seek emotional fulfillment elsewhere. Pat then paints a positive picture of Candy, expressing gratitude that she survived the altercation and emphasizing her strength. However, the prosecution sees through Pat's testimony and portrays Candy as a manipulative individual. The other witness called to the stand is Dr. Fasson, who testifies about Candy's underlying mental health issues and reveals that she suffered from dissociative identity disorder. He explains that her childhood trauma was triggered by Betty's actions during the attack, which led her to dissociate from the reality of the murder. The defense argues that Candy's dissociative episodes and the trauma she experienced led to her anger and loss of control during the incident. Don continues his questioning of Dr. Fasson, trying to establish that Candy knowingly killed Betty. However, the psychiatrist asserts that it's highly unlikely for Candy to have done so. Then, the prosecution attempts to cross-examine Dr. Fasson but fails to undermine his testimony. During a break in the hearing, Candy confronts Don about why he showed her the murder weapon during her testimony. Don explains that it was necessary for the public and the jury to see her as a human being with flaws and vulnerability. The final witnesses called are fellow churchgoers who share their perspectives on Betty. Pastor Ron is among those who spoke negatively about Betty. Meanwhile, Don's wife expresses her unhappiness with how he portrayed Betty in order to save Candy. Eventually, the hearing concludes with Don being arrested for contempt of court, but he is released on emergency bail filed by Robert. The next morning, the jury begins deliberations while Candy expresses her anticipation for the trial to be over and hopes for a verdict of not guilty. However, Pat believes that regardless of the outcome, their lives will never be the same. He predicts that the jury may not find Candy guilty, but may also not find her innocent, which would require them to leave Wiley and start anew. Candy acknowledges that she's fortunate to have Pat's unwavering support throughout the ordeal. In the final credits, it's revealed that Candy and Pat have separated after their move to Georgia. Alan Gore, shortly after Betty's death, married a woman from the same church but later divorced her. He went on to marry a third time and eventually settled in Maine. Dawn, the defense attorney, went on to pursue a political career and ran for governor of Texas a few years after the trial. However, tragically, he ended his own life in 1998. The autopsy report on Betty concluded that she was not pregnant at the time of her murder. And on the other hand, her children were adopted by her parents following Alan's remarriage. In the aftermath of the trial, Candy worked as a therapist in Georgia. She works alongside her daughter Jenny, helping teens and adults with their mental health. The End